thank you for uh, inviting me. It's, it's honor to be here, and it's not only honor. It's it's very pleasant to be in Latvia because all all the times if I'm thinking that how hard the life is in Estonia and how ridiculously strange thing our regulator is expecting from the banking sector, then I come to the uh, Latvia and all of a sudden I hear the things that will be how to say smooth my mind that it's not so awful in Estonia after all. <laughs> so thank you Latvians uh, supporting Estonian spirit. So, uh, uh, I, I have uh, lots of text here but I not will stop, stop on those. If the slides will be available for you then maybe you can find uh, something to overlook and I, I put the links also for, for our uh, uh, latest regulations. Uh, I, I will not uh, stay on that slide very long uh, because it's quite similar to you, I think, that we have new law, new regulations, uh, new guidelines by the FSA. Uh, our FSA guideline is a little bit different than they used to be previously because first time uh, in Estonian history, or FSA has also added appendix to guidelines which are uh, list of criteria uh, for money laundering from Estonian perspective uh, and FSA has compiled this list by, by their own um, experiences from the different supervisory actions uh, from, for example from Danske Bank and, and other so it's, it's quite detailed list and usually similar thing is provided by the FIU, but this time also FSA has uh, provided the list with uh, uh, potential suspicious criteria uh, to detect uh, potential money laundering. And also it's the uh, first time when they uh, approach uh, East through different layers uh, of money laundering. So they are describing the methods of uh, placement, uh, layering and integration so it's uh, uh, quite uh, from from banking sector point of view it's 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 quite welcome because first time it's a little bit more clear what the FSA uh, how, how they see the money laundering uh, is happening in Estonia through Estonian banks and and not only the banking sector but uh, through Estonian all, all, all potential uh, uh, companies uh, then we have list of um, uh, uh, new legislative initiatives, maybe the not so surprising is that uh, the, the fines will be higher because in Estonia still, I don't even know how, uh, but, but we haven't took over those EU directives uh, from the fines per perspective. So uh, up to now we have 400,000 maximum fine for, for uh, AML violations. Uh, now, now they will ra raise to the Europe level, so it's uh, mean, Minimum maximum will be five million euros uh, or or ten percent from the consolidated turnover. Um, most important, maybe here for me, is that uh, we will regulate more in details uh, virtual asset service providers because uh, in Estonia this area is regulated since 2008, uh, before Bitcoin was invented. And the main reason was uh, decentra not decentralized, but centralized uh, electronic money uh, and mainly web money from Russia. And that's why in Estonia we regulated this area since 2008. But uh, now we have issue that uh, this regulation is uh, not strong enough because the getting the license is rather easy because only thing uh, which will prevent the Estonian FIU to provide license to company on, on that area is when the com somebody related to company is convicted for, for some criminal action. So, so it's, it's basically only thing when the FIU can refuse. And that's why now, now we will introduce fit and proper system for virtual asset service providers and, and there are some other initiatives. But as it's draft law, then it's a little bit difficult to say how we will en end up finally. Uh, and of course everybody knows the Danske case or like in in Denmark they call it Estonian case not the Danske case uh, and, and uh, since 2014 when the FSA compiled this audit I've heard that this was the longest audit report they have compiled on AML it was more than 300 pages 
fortunately or unfortunately, I haven't seen it, or nobody has seen in Estonia, at least uh, from the banking sector, uh, outside of Danske Bank, at least. So, so we, we don't know much about that, but uh, from that, uh, it started slowly rolling, and now, now the Danske is already a little bit forgotten, and all the media is concentrating on Swedbank case. But although it seems to be that it's completely different case, at least uh, from the banking perspective, because in in Dansk, uh, the situation was at, at, at least seems to be uh, completely different uh, than than Swedbank case. Uh, this Orto program we had, it was quite interesting program. Uh, all the banks uh, on C CEO level and, and heads of compliance met with the management of the um, FSA. Uh, and before the meeting, uh, FSA asked uh, information from the banks about uh, high-risk uh, customers, uh, biggest uh, transacting customers. And there was quite uh, detailed discussions about those customers, so our FSA wanted to have understanding to the management of the banks know their highest transacting customers and higher risk customers. So those, those different actions which we have seen uh, and the off-site inspections, uh, many of them each year and one extensive uh, in, in the beginning of, of year, uh, they somehow like demonstrate uh, expectation of the regulators so so still we see that the non-residents are high risk and that a quite strong concentration on, on that area and to be honest then uh, uh, I think that those expectations are not fully clear uh, what it means because some some days it feels like uh, it's how to say not maybe not possible is maybe strong strong expression but uh, it, it it's not wise to service any russian originated uh, businessman because uh, the expectations are very very high on that uh, not only the source of wealth which is obvious but the question is that you have to predict what happens with that person for next 10 20 years will be the criminals one day because it seems to be that uh, if you onboard the customers which, which have quite uh, uh, decent uh, background during the onboarding time, but if it happens later, five or ten years later, that uh, still there are some al alleged criminal activities maybe, then it's already will, how to say, punish the bank why, why they onboarded the customer at all. And, and it's maybe one example, but uh, the concentration on uh, non residents is quite strong uh, but sometimes <laughs> but same time mm, uh, as head of uh, Estonian banking association anti money laundering working group I, I have to visit sometimes different ministries to discuss different topics then usually those topics are not about uh, anti money laundering measures and how to improve measures and how to avoid customers but those discussions in different ministries usually are very concentrated on why we don't open accounts, why we don't open accounts for foreign investors. Uh, and, and even one minister asked that uh, we have lots of business, uh, businessmen from Russia with good, solid reputation. They want to open accounts in Estonia bank, banks, but they can't open because not, none of the banks will, will don't want to open those, those bank accounts. So, so I have very, very mixed feelings what to do then, because uh, part of the, how to say, state is blaming us that uh, we launder the money and, and we accept Russia, Russian uh, money. And, and part of the state is uh, asking uh, why you don't open ac accounts for the Russian businessmen who want to invest in Estonia. And it's not only, of course, the Russian businessman, but, but of course, today for foreign investors, it's, it's very difficult to invest into Estonia because the, the KSC expectation for the non-residents is very, very high. And uh, it, it, it doesn't matter, is it, is it uh, German, Brazilian, or Russian investors? So, so we want to be absolute, absolutely sure about the background and source of wealth and everything. And 
I don't ac actually know how, how the system in Latvia is, but in Estonia, if you want to invest into Estonia, you want to buy, buy shares of Estonian company, uh, then you have to have securities account, but you also have to have uh, a current account. So it means that all, all those investors, even if they only investing in one company in Estonia, it, it means uh, quite a uh, struggle for, for, for the bank and for the customer. Uh, the Student Banking Association is a little bit different from, from the many other countries. Uh, we have only two employees there, and all the working groups are run by the people from the bank, like AML Working Group, so I'm head of AML Working Group, but also actually I'm working in the bank, and it's like community work or voluntary work. Uh, and the and AML committee has been active uh, since I think that since 99 since the beginning of the law and uh, for for most of the years we are meeting at least once a month uh, but uh, for last four years uh, we are meeting uh, twice a month so it's it's quite active working on most active in in in, in banking association and um, we don't produce much papers, but we, we discuss things. But, but this year we, we introduced uh, um, AML policy type of document uh, from the Banking Association and a little bit uh, different approach than, than some countries and also Latvia. But we, we are not aiming to, how to say, with that guideline to describe everything the banks has to do, but our aim was to, to concentrate on those areas where the legislation or FSA guideline is a little bit uh, short. So there, even after those 100 pages long uh, guidelines, there are things you can interpret in different ways. Uh, one, one simple ex example is that we don't have proper understanding uh, who are PEPs, because in Estonian law, it's stated, for example, that higher officers from the army are PEPs. But what does this mean, higher officer? So in Estonian Banking Association, we have defined uh, up to state will explain in, in more details. Up to then, we have our own understanding what, what are those higher officers. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say, we don't have similar settings like, like uh, this one here. Uh, we have extensive work in, in those AML working group. But one thing we introduced since this year that uh, it twice twice a year, we have uh, trainings for AML specialists. It's, it's one thing which, which we, we felt is missing because, okay, the heads of departments, uh, MLROs, uh, head of compliance, they probably can go to the different conferences, but now there are hundreds and hundreds, peop hundreds people working in the AML area, a lot of junior employees, and how to train them, it's, it's a very difficult question. So if the banking association approach, uh, we thought that we, we tried to fulfill that gap and, and twice a year we have trainings for AML specialists for the banks and uh, they are more not so maybe not so general level but they are trying to mm, target some concrete issue for example uh, in, in one meeting we had uh, crypto money laundering how you can use crypto for the money laundering how, how it will work how it looks like what kind of methods there there are what to detect there. Also, he had lawyer uh, who described uh, why there are uh, complex structures sometimes, uh, especially in, in f from the foreign company's perspective, how to understand uh, those structures better. Uh, upcoming uh, training, which will be now, is targeting on tax issues, tax fraud. Uh, people from the tax department are coming uh, to share their experience, how, how, what kind of uh, cases they have had and uh, where the banks can uh, be, how to say, understand the better the, the tax crimes and, and report also better on, on tax-related money laundering cases. No, it's, yeah, uh, I think that it's self-speaking, so lots of things happening, uh, and but, but the issue is yeah, that actually uh, with different types of de-risking. Uh, I think that it's for some areas it's very difficult to, 
do business uh, currently. And like the Commerzbank example was that they e exited some countries, some areas, uh, because they felt that they, they don't have enough uh, monitoring powers and uh, understanding of the risks. So they de-risked and now they are like coming back. I think in Estonia it's also happening this way that some certain areas are basically de-risked by the banks but banks, how to say, want to have better understanding about the uh, uh, expectation of uh, regulators and also to enhance their technical capabilities, which still need enhancing in, in most of banks, I would say, uh, to apply new technologies to, to use machine learning uh, and, and, and et cetera. So, so I think that uh, if it settles down, uh, we have better technical capabilities and we have clearer expectation from the regulators, then I think that uh, also this de-risking de will, will be turned back and, 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 and maybe it will be a little bit better. Uh, from the numbers point of view, one fetish number for the, all the regulators in our area is share of non-resident deposit ratio. Then as you can see, and basically since 2014, uh, those numbers have dropped and uh, it's uh, it's mostly related, uh, starting with the Danske case, uh, although in the public media it, it came somewhere in 2017, I think, but you can see already that uh, uh, from 2015 it started to drop. And today it's somewhere eight something, and uh, it, it basically means that uh, even from the statistical point of view, it definitely hits uh, foreign investments in, in into Estonia. So because, as you can see, the offshore uh, part, and we consider, for example, Cyprus also as offshore, is, is very low. And if you look into those uh, non-resident deposits, then uh, Russia is uh, from this 8% something, from, from that 8%, Russia part is 6%. So um, mainly why Germany, uh, German main reason is that many banks are using different uh, deposit solutions from the Germany to attract uh, German, uh, how to say, wealthy persons uh, assets uh, to, to have long-term deposits because in Germany it's basically zero uh, but banks who need uh, more uh, deposits then, then, then are offering something over, <laughs> over zero. And a and, and, and couple, couple of banks are using a couple of uh, such uh, deposit solution platforms uh, only for then long-term uh, deposits. And also the payment, uh, numbers of payments uh, have dropped uh, from the USD perspective. But, uh, but I would say that in Estonia, it's not only the USD correspondent banks, which are, how to say, big trouble for us to, to find. And, and we are very happy that Citibank uh, uh, came back to the market. So we have at least uh, one, one bank who has now uh, Citibank as correspondent bank for USDs and uh, and it, it does mean that they have done due diligence for the country and it does mean that uh, many banks have discussions with them and maybe maybe other other banks have uh, uh, their USD flows uh, possible but uh, it's not only USD I would say that even uh, for the if, if you're not a Scandinavian bank, uh, as LHV, where I come from, is, then it's even struggle to have uh, Scandinavian currencies, correspondent banks. So, so it's currently, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite, quite difficult in, in all, all the currencies where you need correspondent banks. It's, it's difficult situations. And later slide, it's just random, <laughs> maybe, pick of uh, challenges we have. Uh, uh, from the banking association point of view, and one thing is, or the first thing from today's topic is also the balancing between compliance and allowing uh, businesses to, 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 to act. 
uh, from the technical point of view, we are struggling with the country very heavily about uh, beneficial ownership uh, register because it's uh, the definition, although it should be clear, isn't clear, and also the way how the differences between these registers and, and if there is some, so let's say, if there is some information about the beneficial owners which, which is stated by the entity to the register is not the same as bank understand, then it seems to be that it is, it's bank issue to deal with that, uh, not state issue, and, and we, we try to, how to say, fight with that idea. But I think that maybe it's, in overall, it's main things I wanted to cover, so I'm happy to answer all your questions if you have. Yeah, Ivor, thank you very much. Uh, what time is our plane? Soon. Soon. So, uh, how much time do we have? I don't know. Oh, we <laughs> <laughs> because I was told that you have to leave at 10.30, now it's 10.51, so... <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Maybe one question then, as a yeah, Thank you very much. I'm here representing business, and uh, I'm concerned uh, about that the system is killing business now in Latvia, in Estonia, and even uh, trying to find uh, crimes financial crimes, real business suffers very, very much. And I would like to ans ask you about balancing compliance, what to, do, what to do you in this sense? Because I think the main problem now is to find this balance. Banks are uh, in stress, I would say. They're pressed by this uh, strict ML law and uh, try to comply with it. They just uh, abuse. Yeah. As I said, I, I think that there is no good way to find the balance today. I think that uh, currently it is awful for the businesses and uh, banks need to enhance their technical capabilities and also, I, I don't know how, how exactly it looks in, uh, in, in Latvia, but I think in Estonia banks we have, I think, more than tripled the compliance stuff in, in all the banks uh, and it means that we are very a lot of young uh, AML specialists everywhere. So we have to bring their, how to say, competence in some level, also the technical capabilities in also some level, and then we can, how to say, uh, have, how to say, better way to, to analyze our customers uh, from onboarding and, and monitoring point of view uh, without putting huge um, manual uh, work there. So I, I think that we, we have to just bring it in, in good level and then we can open up those uh, today de-risked areas. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, it's my personal opinion, of course. Maybe there are better ways, but it's, it's currently my understanding. Okay. But now I have to run. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for being with us.